Kennedy, of course, is shot through the chest, and uh, I'm shot through both arms. Prococo is shot through the hand and one of the lower arms. It's been a bad day. You are about to embark upon the great crusade to meet this mounting aggression. And make no mistake about it, good will prevail. What we're supposed to do is to uh, uh, capture uh, uh, the Japanese air base at Cape Gloucester. It will be done in a two-stage operation. The uh, Army, the 12th Cavalry Regiment, will land on the south part of, uh, of New Guinea, uh, about uh, New Britain. It will land there uh, on about the 12th day of December. Uh, we will uh, embark on the 24th day of, of December at Oro Bay. Since we are going to be the first wave ashore, Company, uh, the 3rd Battalion, uh, uh, 7th Marines, uh, we will go aboard on APDs. These are four stacker destroyers that were built during World War I and during the period before the middle 1930s. They had taken two boiler rooms out of them, and they had converted it into uh, uh, troop quarters to, uh, they can carry 130 men. Now, the Higgins, they carry, the, each of those vessels has four Higgins boats. A Higgins boat, the type they're then using with a ramp on it, at Guadalcanal, they used them that didn't have ramps. You had to vault over the bulwark to go ashore. And uh, we, uh, we uh, go aboard uh, the sands, and uh, we are, are going to be aboard them, and we will sail on the, 20, uh, on the 24th. Uh, on the 25th, we're on the, uh, we will land there on what is Christmas Day in the United States, which will be the 26th day. Now, as we sail through the straits uh, and approach the coast, uh, we have a movie. It's my favorite movie. And it's also the movie That'll be the last movie a number of my friends are going to see. It would be Yankee Doodle Dandy uh, with James Cagney. And that's the best movie you're going to see for your send-off if you're never going to see another movie, as you, can, as you can well understand. Well, the, uh, the Army, uh, we have uh, MacArthur's Navy, which includes Australian warships and American warships, and it'll be the first time. Don't let those people who are in the Pacific, uh, in Europe, tell you that they use rockets uh, uh, from LCIs. That's the first time they use LC rockets uh, firing from an LCI. So they, we all embark. Uh, and as, uh, the Jap they're, they're giving the uh, Japanese hell with bombing uh, and strafing, particularly the, uh, the uh, uh, B B-26, that's the flying coffin, and the uh, A-20, A-20. And we uh, uh, start moving toward the beach, and we wonder what the devil those things are. There's an LCI. It looks like they got packing cases on them. And all of a sudden, you start hearing whoosh, 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 and it's the rockets going off, and the rockets are pulverizing the beach uh, we're going to be on. We're going to be, uh, the first battalion will be on our left, and their objective is to capture Target Hill. We're going to uh, land at a place up from uh, Target Hill. Uh, the 3rd uh, Battalion, and the 
uh, 2nd Battalion will come in and move to the right going toward the airfield. And uh, we come in and, uh, uh, la uh, and uh, make a landing. Uh, it's fairly rough, so we got ashore. And the, the, uh, it's a hell of a, a jungle we've got to land and get in. Now, uh, at this time, uh, our, reg our, company co our, reg our battalion commander is Colonel Williams. Colonel Williams is a man that you aren't proud of serving under. Now, the regimental commander is J Julian Frisbee. He's a big, long, unfolding man. And after the war, he was the warden of Michigan City, the Indiana State Penitentiary for Hardcore at Michigan City. And uh, his executive officer is a man that all Marines like to bra brag they served under. That's Chesty Puller. Chesty Puller is a man that has had five Navy crosses. Earlier when we're landing there, uh, working parties, we first got to be big of fans. We knew of Chesty Puller well. He's a Marine Corps legend. And uh, we were, uh, uh, he came out and reamed uh, Williams out for working us too long an hour, so we all secretly applauded him. Now, uh, we ha our battalion uh, exec was Major Nicholson. He came in the peacetime Marine Corps, and he was 21 years a lieutenant. So he is, uh, we always thought he was a horse's ass. But he was a good guy, we finally decided. It was Williams who was the horse's ass. Uh, because he's the man that uh, uh, is going to have serious trouble when, we, when, the, when the people under him have more serious trouble. Because he's, not, he's behind us. If he was up in front of us and with us, he would have probably been a KIA. So uh, we land and uh, push in. We run into slight resistance on the first day, which is the 26th there, but it's the Christmas day here. We move along the beach and see the Japanese come in and strafe us, and the Japanese sink a destroyer right offshore. We can see its bow go up, and we dig in. And we dig in, move in about uh, what we're going to do. We have a perimeter set up which is roughly uh, anchored on Target Hill on the left and the area where our right went ashore on the right. And uh, it is a, in an area that is very swampy. In our 12-man squad, first sergeant is Arnie. In the Marine Corps, the first sergeant is more a clerk type. The gunnery sergeant, 90% of the time, is a real gung-ho Marine. Heavily tattooed. Probably had served in China, but our gunnery sergeant ain't that way. That's gunnery sergeant Meterelli. He'd been the company barber, and that's definitely not a warlike man. So he's our gunnery sergeant. And uh, we had, uh, so we had, uh, the first day, the first, the second day they're there, uh, there's a they decide they're going to use us uh, to uh, support the thrust of the airport. And we go down there, and we come back. And the Japanese are attacking to our left. And when they attack to our left, we have a trigger-happy guy come back. Uh, luckily, he is in first platoon. He's not in our platoon. And he sees a guy sitting there, and while I'm thinking, bang, he shot and killed one of our men. So first man to die in our regiment is by friendly fire. That's not a good, uh, uh, that's not good for the morale. Now on the second day of January, they brought in the 5th Marines and it's going to be a big push to push the Japanese back uh, from the airport 
we have captured the airport and pushed them back west, uh, eastward toward Rabaul, toward Borgen Bay. So what we're going to do, we're going to move out and anchor the leftmost man in L Company would be about 50 yards from the rifle pits along the perimeter. We had been out there a couple days before we were going, and we had seen no Japanese. We had seen this stream that is going to be flowing roughly parallel to our line of advance, but no one was there. So we had a pretty good breakfast on the morning of the 2nd. Now this is New Year's Day. I was back in Washington, I was back here, I'd have a bad hangover at this time. And we're going to move off. And uh, uh, we're, we're in a rainforest. Now a rainforest, the branches and the leaves are always high. You've got pretty good visibility for 100 yards up uh, before you run into the, the leaves of the trees. So you have a fairly good visibility of up to maybe 75 yards as you move along. So we are the extreme left of the company, of the company. We're the uh, uh, Seepley's com uh, squad is on our left. Now, before, about a, three weeks before we went, I'm not going, I'm going to say Marine X. I'm not going to use this name because he might still be alive. Uh, Marine X uh, was always boasting. He was new. He had joined the company, uh, and he joined the Seventh Marines along about June of 1943. Uh, uh, and he was always telling us he you know, went to officer's candidate school. But he doesn't tell us why he busted out of officer's candidate school. And about 10 days before we go to New Guinea, uh, uh, go to uh, Cape Gloucester to embark, the uh, Marine, Gung Ho Marine X gets very, very drunk. He lives in the tent next to me. Now, the tents usually had eight men in the pyramidal tent. So he's one, uh, he's in our squad, but he's in the next tent adjoining the tent I'm in. And we have a, my best friend, uh, Swish McKenzie, is in the first platoon, and he's across the company street. And uh, Marine X, super gung-ho Marine, is drunk. And he gets a crying jag on. And he lays on the ground and starts saying, I'm too young to die. A bunch of us gather around him, and we're, I'm not very, you could ask my poor wife if she was alive, I'm not a very sympathetic fellow. And uh, we're in the tent. I've come over from the tent I'm in, and we're in there, because the guy's making a lot of noise, he's crying and saying he's too young to die. And uh, we're saying all these horrible things about him. Kenneth McKenzie, who's a good friend of mine, and the last guy from our unit, to go to the great beyond. He died two years ago. And, uh, and I no, now know, and he is the one that kept in touch with everybody. And he says, you guys are saddest. You guys shouldn't stand around here and, uh, and talk nasty about Marine X. And we just shook our head at McKenzie. And uh, as we we're moving along, we halt. And we come to this creek, this, uh, this uh, stream, that is running uh, at right angles to the way our advance or 
or parallel to our line of advance. And we start down, it's about the, from one side of the declivity to the side where our friends are, and I'm being facetious, is about uh, 35 yards. The drop, if you put a, 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 a drove a wire here and run it straight across and dropped a plumb bob down, it would fall about uh, 15 yards before it hit water. So we arrived there. Now, uh, uh, on my right is, on my left is uh, Private Saxetter, and then to the left of him is Vito Prococo. Now, think of a typical Italian. We had a number of them in our unit, and they like to argue. And on his left is the gunnery sergeant, the man that had been the com uh, company uh, barber before being at the right place at the right time, John Mutarelli. And on Mutarelli's left is Silcox, uh, a rather crude fellow uh, from West Virginia. On his left, I do not know the deployment of the men to uh, Silcox's left because they're out of my view side. And uh, on my right is, uh, is uh, a fellow, uh, Martin, a uh, small fellow, uh, and uh, he's on my right, and then we'll go in to the third squad. He was in the third squad. And I see two men standing on the same level that I am on the, the side of the stream I am on. Call I'm on the uh, west side of the stream, and these two gentlemen are on the other side. And it's very obvious who they are, because they have different type helmets. So I, I sent the word back to Sykes-Setter, should I open fire? And he says, yes. So I open fire, bang, 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 fire about three aimed rounds before they start firing back. Whether I hit both of them, hit one of them, or hit neither of them, I will never know because they suddenly reply. In the downslope on the far side of the stream, they have a pillbox. Dug, uh, thrown up of heavy coconut logs, and they return fire. To the right, as I look across, there is another pillbox, which I cannot see, but I can see the tracer fire coming from it. In the Marine Corps and the Japanese Army, the German Army, you fire by tracer. You fire your first couple of rounds, and get, as soon as you have it sighted in, you, keep, you know where your target is. The fortunate thing for me, the Japanese machine gun opposite where we are, is a Hotchkiss type. It is a 7.7 .7 weapon. The, uh, the normal Japanese uh, machine gun, if they were not dug in in a position, would be a Nambu. It fires a 6.5 caliber weapon. The Nambu has a very rapid rate of fire. Hum, 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 hum. The Hotchkiss, hum, 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 as it fires. The first time I know it's firing, I can see the tracers coming, and uh, I hear a shout, the gunny shot, the gunny shot. That's the gunny. Uh, it's hit him. Uh, he's laying down. Uh, uh, he's laying down flat with the slope with him, and he's hit in the re uh, in the upper hit through the hit, hit through the lower arm hit through the forearm, and it also hits his uh, carbine, and he gets hit with a bunch of fragments. The next guy to be hit. Now this guy is traversing from 
right to left. The next is Vito Prococo. Vito Prococo is probably on his hands and knees. I can see Vito. He is hit in the wrist and the hand. He leaps up, looks at me, sprays me with blood, spurting at me. Then they probably hit Sackstetter next. Or if they didn't, they hit Sackstetter immediately after me. Because I am sitting down on my keister. Sitting on my keister with my legs folded like this. Firing at the uh, gun uh, that's across from me. Then, uh, about, and I remember Prococo uh, says, I'm ruined for life, I'm ruined for life, something like that. So I do not know whether Sackstetter is hit before, uh, before I am or after I am. And uh, then I'm hit. It hits me in the right, uh, hits me in the left arm, about three inches below the elbow, and exits from about two inches above the joint. It cuts the two of the three nerves that run my hand, the radial and the ulna. It does not cut the medium nerve, uh, or I couldn't make a fist if it did that. Fortunately, it has a slow rate of fire. If it had been a Nambu, I would have got the next one right here. Because the next one hits me here. And I'm, I'm evidently lying, I'm at, a, I'm at a crouch still. Because I can see the, where the ball, the ball rips through my dungarees. And I can see the blood seeping up. Fortunately, it is not spurting. And then they go down the line. Meanwhile, they have knocked out our machine gun that's supporting us. It's up on about four, it's up in distance, it's about three rods, and it's about two feet on a higher elevation than I am. They kill, the, they kill one of the gunners and also nail the uh, uh, platoon corpsman. He's hit in the face, handsome fellow. He doesn't, he's not handsome as a corpse. And, uh, and by that time, they're firing off to my right. They're, and they've already killed these members of the squad. Whether they killed them when they were coming down from my right, but I think it was probably when they traversed a second time. They killed the two BAR men. So they've knocked out the one machine gun supporting us, and the two BARs are silenced. That's all within about, 40, uh, within about 20 minutes. Now, uh, back, back somewhat behind me, near Kennedy. Kennedy has been hit through the chest. He's going to live. He was hit through the chest, and he's going to live. And he calls to McMillan. McMillan is an assistant BAR man. McMillan had entered the Marine Corps when he was 16 years old. He's now 17 and weighs 140 pounds. And he says, Mac, will you, chicken, we call him chicken. In the Marine Corps, you call them not because they're chicken, because they're afraid. You call them chicken if they're underage. He says, chicken, will you help, will you help X to the rear? So X will help Chicken McMillan to the rear. Somewhere between the firing line and the aid station, he abandons McMillan. And McMillan dies. He gets back to Six Bay and then fakes combat fatigue. He tries to set off a hand grenade where it would be more dangerous to us than it would be to the Japanese, and there were no Japanese in. So X uh, had better make it last. If he ever went back to that unit again that was so badly shot up, someone would have sent him 
and it would be not a Jap to a happy hunting ground. So uh, they uh, still have one more guy to get, and that's Reynolds, a typical West Virginia hillbilly, a man we had to give a sand bath one time to uh, to get him to take a shower. He is KI. So those are the five that are KIA'd that day. Uh, well, uh, excuse me, Sally Stetter is mortally wounded that day. He doesn't die for more than another year. Uh, Kennedy, of course, is shot through the chest, uh, and uh, I'm shot through both arms. Prococo is shot through the hand and one of the lower arms. And the only person that is not a casualty is the assistant squad leader, Wojcicki. So the job we've had, it's been a bad day. Well, as I'm laying there, I decide I'm going to try to get out of there because I now know there are two machine guns. There's one almost opposite me, and there's one to our right. So I, I, I know I, and I'm on the slope down. My head's this way, my feet are back. So I try to, I'm thrashing around to try to get turned perpendicular to the machine gun rather than parallel to the machine gun, hoping that I maybe can get to my feet. As I'm doing that, the son of a bitch shoots, sees this motion, fires back, shoots the left side of my heel off, and puts a about a uh, eight or nine inch, probably a quarter of an inch deep, not fortunately not deep enough to break my pelvis across my gluteal region, which I find out when the medics uh, put me in the hospital. That's called the gluteal region, the uh, flesh on your butt. So then I communicate so that I know Saxeter is wounded. Saxeter uh, says, Ed, uh, I'm going to, since I'm shot in both legs, I think I have a broken leg. I'm bleeding badly. I will let, I'm going to grab your, your, uh, your feet and see if you and I can work something together out so we can get out. And uh, then uh, after about another hour, it's starting to get dark, but I thought I may be dying because it's getting dark, and it's about four hours has elapsed. So then I work around and wrestle myself, so now I'm parallel to the Japanese. And I'm able, since I can use my legs to thrust upward, so I thrust upward and I get onto my knees. And I walk up the slope till I hit the level ground. And apparently about that time, the Japanese gunner had seen me. Or something told me to fall. So I fall, I let myself lie flat and hug Mother Worth like a child, like a baby would hug his mother if he's nursing. And they try to get me, but they can't get low enough. Then uh, uh, I hear Buckley saying, help's coming, help's coming. Uh, uh, and uh, I, but he doesn't take any action. Finally, the people that are going to save my life undoubtedly are going to save Kennedy's life and make a try to save Saxstetter's life are going to be O'Leary, the lieutenant of the weapons platoon, and our corpsman, our other corpsman, Hartman. They are back about 25 yards from where I'm laying. And they use, they get in a prone position and use their toes to push them forward. And they arrive on their bellies. And, uh, and Hartman says, where have you given yourself a shot of morphine? And I say, will you carry a morphine syrup? I says, no, I've got both arms broken. I can't use them. So he gets uh, a couple of uh, 
of uh, Surrettes and gives me two shots of morphine. And then they're going to carry me out the same way, using their toes to pull and holding on to my dungarees and pull me back. And I arrive at the uh, aid station, which is about uh, 100 yards to the rear, where they, they gather around me. The carman comes over and uh, immediately uh, starts giving uh, first aid. But the first thing he does is uh, he's going to cut me by, into my veins here and here because he's going to give me two. He's going to give me two uh, two bottles of uh, plasma. Two bottles of plasma. Then he uh, then he uh, says, "Are you shot any other place?" Because he can't give me plasma in my arms. I says, "In the in the heel." He picks up my right foot and he says, no, you're not. And I said, look at the other foot. And he says, yes, you are. Then, since I didn't smoke, and uh, the corpsman now has me stabilized, sending for a crutcher bearer to get me back to the rear, to the company, uh, to the regimental hospital. And he lights a cigarette and sticks it in my mouth. And I spit it out and I say, sorry, Doc, I don't smoke. So they finally get a uh, uh, six guys up. I weigh the same now, 182, 172 pounds that I weighed at that time. And six guys carry me to the rear. They've got to carry me about a third of them, uh, probably about 200 yards to where they have a Jeep fitted up like an ambulance. So it can carry four, four wounded people out. I remember they saying, boy, this son of a bitch is heavy. I met one of them later on to help carry me out. He said, boy, you were heavy. So I said, well, you, you, you thank God I wasn't a 200 pounder. I was only 173 pounds. So they get me back to the aid station, uh, to the regimental uh, aid station, and they clean me up and, uh, and, uh, give me a transfusion now. They don't give a transfusion up where you uh, are not, uh, not in the, uh, uh, the regimental hospital and uh, clean me up. I soon have the same amount of clothes on as I did when I came out of my mother's womb. I'm new, I'm stripped naked. Then they uh, pack, they, what they do, they pack your wounds with uh, Vaseline gauze because they want them to heal from the inside out. Then they finally have me stabilized, uh, and the corpsman says, are you hungry? And I said, yes. I haven't eaten since 5.30 this morning. And he says, well, it's about 3 o'clock this afternoon. So he says, do you like uh, tomato juice? And I says, yes. So I'm a hog. He brings a gallon can of tomato juice, opens it with a key to the kingdom, and I drink about half of it without stopping, and then I puke all over him and all over myself, and he has to clean me out up again. So that's the beginning of uh, my uh, 26 months in the hospitals. <laughs> ¶¶